Good evening. Good evening, everyone. If I could get everyone to take their seats. Good evening. I'm J.P. Walsh, the director of the Coastal Resources Center at URI and a professor in the Graduate School of Oceanography. Welcome to the second event of the Sustaining Our Shores Honors Colloquium. This colloquium focuses on our shores and seas because we live in the ocean state and we, along with people around the world, face significant challenges associated with climate change, socioeconomic disparities, and marine resource limitations. The United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development has just begun with URI's great expertise in coastal and ocean science and management. We have a responsibility to educate and help address related issues and continue to advance our understanding of the marine realm. This year, the Coastal Resources Center at URI is celebrating the, its 50th anniversary, and the Graduate School of Oceanography is recognizing 60 years. Together with the College of Environment and Life Sciences, Arts and Sciences, the College of Engineering, and other partners at URI and around the world, we must be leaders locally and globally. A committee of URI faculty and staff has planned the Sustaining Our Shores Honors Colloquium to educate and encourage discussion and collaboration. Please now join me in thanking the planning committee, the honors program, and the many sponsors for enabling this year's honors colloquium. Before we get into the program, I thank those attending in person for wearing a mask throughout the duration of the event. Also, please note the fire exits uh, around the room. Restrooms are found uh, off the foyer where you entered. Uh, also, I want to make you aware that in conjunction with the colloquium and specifically related to the topic of coasts in crisis, we'll be hosting a screening of the award-winning movie Tidewater this Thursday, the 30th at 7 p.m. at URI. Please check the colloquium website to register. And for next Tuesday, we have scheduled a panel on coast and crisis uh, titled Risk and Resilience in New England. Please don't miss this event, and you can see the details of the panel behind me. At this time, I would like to introduce Mrs. Silvermoon Mars LaRose to give a land acknowledgement and blessing. Mrs. LaRose earned a bachelor's degree in sociology with a minor in justice, law, and society from the University of Rhode Island. She is a citizen of the Narragansett tribe, a resident of Charlestown, and has been selected to participate in the inaugural class of the Rhode Island Foundation's Equity Leadership Initiative. Let's welcome her to the stage. Boston. Tonight I have a quick story for you. A great big man filled his mail truck with the day's deliveries. Atop the cases of mail sits a little girl. They're off to deliver the mail to the community around the URI campus. They travel up and down the street, filling mailboxes and dropping letters into slots. Dogs bark their hellos. Homeowners pop their heads out to say hi to their favorite mailman. Sometimes they stand and chat. Sometimes he lends a helping hand in a task, particularly to the elders. When they reach the international housing, all the children come running out. It's their favorite mailman. The man with the red rubber bands. The big, long ones that are perfect for slingshots. This six foot five, 300 pound hero of the neighborhood laughs a giant belly laugh as the children gather around him. Sometimes they ran into his sister-in-law, Jan Spears, a Narragansett woman who worked in housing 
or his other sister-in-law, Diana Mars, a Narragansett woman, in the admissions office. Or if he was unlucky, as his jokes would imply, his actual sister, Janice Hill, who worked in the Bursar's office. After they left the campus, they might pick up Kenneth Mars, his first cousin, a Narragansett man who worked at the URI campus for years, walking to and fro, taking pictures of everyone and everything all over South County. That giant person, everyone's favorite person, was my dad, Roland Mars. This was his home, these lands that we are on here. His memory is here, and the memory of all those who have been here, and more who are here now. Students, staff, neighbors, visitors, ancestors, because their presence is always here. These are the lands of the Narragansetts, and we are still here. The practice of opening a public event with a statement recognizing the traditional homelands of the indigenous people located there is becoming more commonplace in the United States. This practice in itself can really help reframe how we understand geographic space and colonially impose geographic biopolitical boundaries. Acknowledging these pre-colonial territories recognizes the hundreds of distinct cultures who have been living on Turtle Island, existing as sovereign nations, governing, protecting, and maintaining these lands for centuries before European invasion. My cousin married the most beautiful and intelligent Diné woman in Donna Spears, and she said land acknowledgement statements are countermeasures to erasure. They publicly recognize the presence of native people prior to European arrival, and their continued relationships and claims to a territory. A statement that disrupts life as usual can serve an important role in our civic and cultural life. Non-Native people live in the United States at the expense of indigenous communities. Everywhere you go in the United States is indigenous land, gained at an immense cost. This is a violent truth that we are often not accustomed to acknowledging. What happens when we do? How would we transform our society if we lived with the knowledge that everywhere we go in the United States is indigenous land? Would it make us think twice about who was not in the room, whose voice is not being heard, whose needs are not being met? What would we do about it once we became aware? A land acknowledgement is not a performance. It is a call to action, a pledge to enact change, and so as I close today, I just hope that I've left you all with the question, what can I do? So to butt me on away on Winnie Nukan, I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you so much, Silver Moon. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight. Elizabeth Rush is the author of Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore and was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for this book. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, among others. She's traveled to Antarctica as an artist and writer in residence for the National Science Foundation and has been the recipient of numerous fellowships and grants. She received a, her BA in English from Reed College and an MFA in nonfiction from Southern New Hampshire University. Currently, she is an assistant professor of, of the practice in the Department of English at Brown University. Please, let's give her a warm welcome to the University of Rhode Island. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight um, in person and digitally for showing up to talk about the ongoing climate crisis. 
thank you very much to the University of Rhode Island and the Honors Colloquium for hosting this event, to JP for that phenomenal introduction, and also to Silver Moon, that's the best land acknowledgement um, I've ever heard, so deep gratitude for that. And she's left us with a wonderful question that I hope we all will carry with us going forward in the next days, weeks, months. Tonight, I'm going to speak to you about this book that I wrote, Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore, which is an on-the-ground investigation of eight different coastal communities all around the country and the impact that rising sea levels are having on them. Each of the book's chapters opens with a testimony delivered in the voice of one of the town's residents about an event or a series of events that woke them up to their own vulnerability and what they decided to do with that information. It's a book about climate change in particular and sea level rise, zooming in on what aspect of climate change I'm talking about, but it doesn't really focus on the science behind the phenomenon. Instead, it looks towards people living on climate change's front lines and asks what we can learn from them about the future that we share. I'll focus tonight primarily on a small community on the eastern shore of Staten Island, a place that Sandy both undid and remade from the ground up. And by digging into the story of Oakwood Beach and also the story behind the story, how this chapter came to be in the book in this way, I hope to pose another pretty fundamental question, and, and it really does echo the one that Silver Moon left us with. Whose voices have been traditionally left out of environmental discourse, and how might the climate crisis give us an opportunity to make this conversation more whole moving forward? We tell ourselves stories in order to live, writes Joan Didion at the opening of the White Album, a famous essay that tries and fails to make sense of how the idealism of the 1960s and California's golden dream gives way to, is consumed by a kind of unrelenting cynicism. Didion says that storytelling works as a sense-making practice at least until it doesn't. That there are moments and phenomena that really test and rend our ability to arrive at a narrative line. I think that climate change is among them, and yet we keep trying to tell this story in a really straightforward way. So in 2011, I started to write about sea level rise for a number of different journalistic publications, and about a year into covering this beat, I started to grow really bored with the kind of language I had to use to get that story into the newspaper. All of these unprecedented events started to sound really eerily familiar. And so it, it occurred to me that climate change was entering into our contemporary culture as like a never-ending set of record-breaking storms, record-breaking heat waves, record-breaking rain and each successive extreme smashes the previous record-breaking record. When I wrote about climate change in this way, and with this kind of tired vernacular, I feared that I was dulling readers to the dynamism at the heart of this transformation. I also started to recognize that these apocalyptic headlines overlooked the very specific ways in which climate change is impacting vulnerable communities, and more importantly, bringing those vulnerable communities sometimes closer together in new and unexpected ways. I also think that these headlines lock certain people and places out of the story when the storm that passes through doesn't qualify as record-breaking, even if it fundamentally upends so many, so many people's lives. And I think we can see that, you know, immediately with Hurricane Ida, which is tied for the fifth strongest storm to hit the U.S. based on wind speed, um, and was deeply impactful, you know, from Philadelphia north, but also in the Louisiana bayou. But just because it wasn't, you know, the strongest storm ever, I think it moved out of the 24-hour news cycle really quickly in comparison to previous hurricanes in the past couple years, the way that we kind of dwell on these devastating events. 
all of this is to say that I think that climate change news and sort of telling this story in a straightforward manner really confuses us into thinking that the conclusion is foregone. Um, I think that it steals some of its mystery, some of what Amitav Ghosh calls its improbability or uncanniness. And I think in doing so, it also steals from us an opportunity to be transformed and not just for the worse by this disruptive force. So I was living in Brooklyn and teaching at the College of Staten Island in our honors program um, when Hurricane Sandy hit. And over 400,000 New Yorkers were inundated. 17% of the city's landmass was underwater. But as you'll come to find out um, during today's talk, those impacts certainly were not evenly distributed. And so this is a map of Sandy inundation in New York City. Or, yep. And I did a little sleuthing to get some uh, potential inundation maps of uh, sea level rise mapped onto social and economic vulnerability in the state of Rhode Island. Um, I'm putting these up here because this is true of almost every single storm that I've covered. Um, we see that often it is vulnerable people who live atop already vulnerable land that are being impacted by these increasingly stronger storms. And so um, the image on the left is you know, south coast, right around where we are. And it's, it's rendering social vulnerability on top of a bathtub model of sea level rise, six feet of inundation. JP and I were talking about this today, that it's actually pretty hard to get um, very geographically specific data on property values and um, income levels. So I had a little bit of a hard time finding geographically specific data to map onto um, inundation levels in Rhode Island. The best that I came up with was the map on the right, which looks at the population, percentage of the population below the poverty line in 1999 and renders that on top of and alongside projected future sea level rise. And you see that um, some of the people that are most vulnerable economically, socially, al also live in these physically vulnerable places. Um, and I'm putting this up here because as I talk about Staten Island tonight, and I talk about the story of this place, I want you to think about the fact that I could just as easily be describing a neighborhood in Providence. I could just as easily be describing one of the places that we call home here in the state of Rhode Island. So in the weeks after the storm, Staten Island entered into a quiet state of quiet crisis. The university where I work closed. The ferry stopped running. One day I drove across the Father, um, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge to deliver a donation to a local help center at New Dorp High School and all along Father Capadano Boulevard, there were like small boats smashed into ranch homes. Um, people sifting through the debris of their lives out on the sidewalk. And when I saw that, I knew many of my students came from New Dorp, um, still lived in New Dorp, and that their lives had come undone in this way that I didn't fully understand yet. Some of my suppositions were immediately rendered true because when the university reopened, a lot of my students didn't come back to class. So generally speaking, CSI students um, attend school and work at the same time. And if their homes were impacted in Hurricane Sandy, they often had to move into temporary FEMA housing or in with um, relatives who lived as far away as upstate New York and Florida. Some lived in Jersey and the ones that lived closer um, but not quite close enough to manage a commute to school and to a job, ultimately put financial stability in front of their priority to get an education. And yet, when I read about the storm in the newspaper, my students' stories didn't appear. 
And I think that's when I really knew that the coverage of the storm and all it gestured towards was really incomplete. I wondered where were my students' stories, where were the stories of folks who flooded before Sandy, who'd already blown through their retirement savings, getting back into their homes after Irene. And in order to kind of go in search of those stories, I started to spend a lot of time on the eastern shore of Staten Island interviewing residents about their long and frustrating path to recovery. I didn't drive a car. I biked and then walked most of the time, going door to door and asking folks to share with me their storm stories. I felt that as I entered these vulnerable communities to ask residents to speak with me about a traumatic experience, I needed to make myself vulnerable too. Um, and I would sometimes share a personal story about a time in my life when someone that I knew or that I loved was hurting me, but that I didn't know how to walk away from. And I'm mentioning this because I started to figure out that I needed to leave my climate change discourse at the door and to engage in conversation and to listen above all else instead. So I started to spend whole afternoons out in these neighborhoods where residents had begun to organize to publicly ask that their homes be purchased and demolished and that the state aid in relocation. This, more than anything else about Hurricane Sandy and its aftermath, really surprised me. It was this clamor rising up from the soggy edge of the city's forgotten borough. The signs that said, Mother Nature wants her land back, and buyout wanted, buyout needed. I wondered, what did residents of these right-leaning, often climate change denying, low-lying, working-class communities know that I didn't? How was it that they were interested in retreat? one of the most progressive and controversial adaptation strategies we have for sea level rise. So residents in these flood prone communities that were interested in selling their homes to the state started grassroots buyout committees. They went door to door educating their neighborhoods on what a buyout could mean and how it might serve them. Each homeowner would get pre-storm prices for their lots. The recovery time would be quick relatively compared to the city's Build It Back program, and it would help residents permanently move away from wrecks. And they kept track of their progress with these hand-drawn maps. Um, and I feel like I put these up here because I found them so moving that, and also so wise. They knew that if this was information that came into the community in a top-down manner, there would be real significant resistance to this idea of retreating from their homes. So they wanted to start with a lateral, a horizontal conversation amongst residents. They also knew that in order to potentially get bought out, they had to have the overwhelming majority of residents on board. It's not really financially viable to you know, buy one property here, one property there. Um, when you go approach the state or federal government to get funding for a buyout, you want parcels ideally that are contiguous um, and that help reduce the overall cost of infrastructure in keep, upkeep in that area where they to be removed. So i had been researching and writing about Oakwood Beach, Staten Island for a little over a year when Patty Schneider, one of the organizers of these buyout committees, invited me to a party that she was holding to celebrate the life of her brother, Leonard Montalto. Leonard had died during the storm. And when I arrived, her niece, Nicole Montalto, grabbed me by the arm and pulled me into Patty's guest bedroom. And she said, you're writing a book, so you will help me memorialize my father. And I'm going to tell you the story of what happened to us on the night of Hurricane Sandy. And she literally spoke for two hours, and I listened. I recorded the entire conversation. And I want to read briefly from Nicole's testimony because I want her voice to enter into our conversation tonight, and because it's really her voice that taught me how to write Rising. Listening to this story is part of what helped me understand that I needed to start each chapter in the voice of a resident. So 
we're going to pick up this story on the night of, actually the day after Sandy. She's in the middle of describing the search for her father, Leonard Montalto. So this is the voice of Nicole. I went into my house. I was screaming for my dad. Everything was upside down. The couches floated to different areas. My bed was up on the wall. The only things that didn't move were my dining room table and my filing cabinet, because both were too heavy. That's where my dog took sanctuary on the filing cabinet. My cat was sitting there on top of my bed. I didn't see my dad. I thought, shit, maybe he left. Maybe he went to someone's house. But then I thought, he wouldn't leave the animals. My dad's wallet was still in his room. There was something else, too, that he left behind. I don't remember what it was. The wallet, that was the biggest thing. It had his money and his ID, and he wouldn't have left the house without those things. Oh, I know what it was. He was on and off with smoking cigarettes. I'm the same way, too, and he left his pack with a cup and a couple of butts, though we never smoked inside the house. It's so weird to timeline things. I spoke with him on the phone. He said it was good I got out when I did, that the water was rushing in. He was on the basement stairs when he was on the phone with me. Did he come back up and smoke two cigarettes? Was that before or after? I saw these things that were cluing me into the idea that he never left my house. And when I started seeing those things, I went down to the basement and began screaming. I was hoping that I would hear him, and at the same time, I wasn't. My dad's friends, once they knew he was missing, they broke all the windows in the basement to get the water out. They started pumping the water, too. People say he was down there for the pump, but I don't see how it could have been the pump. What the hell could a pump do? The basement was already flooded. When we pulled up on Wednesday morning, my father's friends told us that they had found him. My father was in my sister's room in the basement. It's tough to see this neighborhood that I grew up in, that my father grew up in, that my sisters and I grew up in. I mean, we spent our entire lives there being demolished. But on the other side, it's nice knowing that this is to protect everyone else and that it can't happen again, at least not to the people I know and the people I love. Maybe the government will do the right thing and let Oakwood go back to nature. After the storm, we were all like, we're moving to a hill. And I moved to a hill. By the time I was 26, I lived through two major floods, one of which took my father's life. Home was that house. It was my dad. It was my mom. It was my sisters. And when my dad was gone, it wasn't home anymore. Those words, when my dad was gone, it wasn't home anymore, stuck with me for a really long time. Here in Desai, the winner of the Man Booker Prize for her diasporic novel, The Inheritance of Loss, recently said, we talk so much about the vocabulary of belonging, but ours is an age of refugees. We need literature that's multiple in nature, that explores, for instance, the idea that an immigrant searching for home will undo our definition of home. The size words call to, in, call to us, I think, to invite new voices into the conversation, to produce literature that denies the idea that there's ever a single official story or one clear linear narrative of any event. And I hear in Desai echoes of the awareness that Nicole Montalto was forced into when Sandy took her father's life. Hers is a story of profound dislocation, of looking for her father and her home where he ought to be. And not only is she discovering that he's not there, he's nowhere to be found. And I think that's a discovery that would play a central role in untethering her from her childhood home and helping fuel Nicole and Patty and many of the neighbors to advocate for and eventually win the 
right to relocate and move in. But I also don't think that that's the only part of what fueled that desire to move away from risk. And I think to get a bigger picture around why residents might ask that their community be broken apart, it's really imperative that we reach back in time. Um, in the image on the left, you see a detail of a USGS map from 1900, and anything that's this darker shade of light blue is an area that was zoned as wetland and as such considered unfit for human use. And anybody who read the New York Times today, there's a great op-ed by a, a guy named Eric Sanderson who tracks pre-industrial um, rivers and wetlands, especially in and around New York City. And he's essentially making this argument in that op-ed. He's saying, like, want to know where the water is going to go? Look to 100 years ago where there used to be a wetland. Um, that's where sea levels are going to have the earliest impact. And that's true here in Rhode Island just as much as it's true in New York City. The deeper I delved into New York City's the past, the more the pre-urban landscape started to shape our appear to shape our pre our present day predicament, not just in terms of topography, but also in terms of demographics. Um, it's not often millionaires who throw down spindly roots, roots on top of swamp land. Uh, sometimes they put spindly roots on barrier beaches, but um, swamp land is a little bit different. And so the second image shows social vulnerability mapped atop flood risk. And you can see that the most flood prone areas of Staten Island are also deemed high to medium to high risk socially. So then you get the, you get the map of the Sandy inundation. And then the final map here um, plots the position of every single person that died during Hurricane Sandy in Staten Island, and the overwhelming majority of storm-related deaths took place on top of land that was pre-industrial wetlands. And I think that combination is part of what really drove residents to start to see this neighborhood once so beloved as perhaps ceasing to offer the comfort that they thought of as being synonymous with that place. So the word retreat usually implies defeat in a military setting. And yet, on the eastern shore of Staten Island, after the storm that took Leonard Montalto's life, retreat started to sound like relief also, relief from the flooding that had already defined many residents' lives. For a long time, I had no idea what to do with Nicole's story. Um, I went home from that celebration of life event, and I transcribed the entire thing. And then that transcription sat in a file on my desktop labeled Oakwood Beach Interviews for years, because I felt that there was like nothing I could do that could make her story any more powerful. As a writer and essayist, I couldn't, I couldn't like tweak her words and somehow up the impact. Um, eventually, I would run into the work of Svetlana Aleksevich and her book, Voices from Chernobyl, which if you haven't read it, go read it. It tells the story of the Chernobyl catastrophe entirely from the perspective of those who lived through the events and is comprised of like 94 different monologues spoken in the voices of different residents, largely of Belarus. She's Belarusian. Um, and when I read that, book, I started to understand how powerful it is when someone speaks in the first person about an event that would change the trajectory of their lives. So many people ask me, you know, what's the process behind the creation of the testimonies in this book? And that's led me to think a lot about what sort of distinguishes my work from more traditional journalism. I think the answer has to do with where I felt my responsibility lies. I always felt that my responsibility was to the speaker of the testimony, where I think a more traditional journalist feels a sense of responsibility to inform public discourse. With these testimonial style essays, I wanted to make sure that I was getting the speaker's voice and their story correct. 
So once I had a transcription, I would cut out like 95% of the text that didn't feel central to the emotional heart of the story, and then I would share it with the interviewee and ask for their feedback. And it was really, I'm sure you can imagine, terrifying to send a copy of this to Nicole um, because I feared that she didn't want it to appear in the book or that she'd want it changed in really significant ways. And yet I felt like if I included it without her approval and her collaboration, then what I was doing in some ways was akin to the extractive industry practices that lie at the heart of the climate crisis. Um, I didn't want to come into this community and take out stories, rip them of their context, and also take away a sense of agency from the speakers. Instead, I wanted this to be part of a healing process through which they might gain a little bit of agency over their story and learn how to tell it in a way that spoke to the emotional impact of the events and the way those events sort of resonated throughout their lives. So I edited the piece, I sent it to Nicole, she edited it, sent it back to me, and we went back and forth um, until she felt that it represented her storm experience. And I mean to bring this up, this part of this writing process up, because I didn't think of these testimonies as giving voice to people who lived on the margins of our stories. These are people who have voices of their own. What I was doing was handing them my microphone and trying to work with them to make their stories as compelling as possible, to share some of the tools that I had developed as a creative nonfiction writer and storyteller. So the more I worked on the project, the more I learned a lot of different things, but one of the things that stuck out to me is that resiliency means really different things in really different places. So in Manhattan, sea level rise resilience means, and I'm gonna quote from the Rebuild by Design plan that's being used to sort of redevelop the southern tip of Manhattan. Landscape berms with seagrass and habitat supports, levees that double as skate parks and amphitheaters seawalls that support pop-up cafes and passive recreation. Well, in Staten Island, resiliency meant taking out a second mortgage on your storm-wrecked home with mud creeping, with mold creeping up the walls. It meant scrubbing the mold off yourself, as John Hujnacki did down at the VFW, um, and that's the image that you see on your right. All of those lighter color bricks are bricks that sat underwater um, and that later were scrubbed clean by members of the VFW. Resilience meant waiting months, sometimes years, for the city's Build It Back program. It meant getting shorted on your flood insurance claim money and the single largest example of fraud in FEMA's history. Um, so all of these unjust circumstances and the history of flooding in this neighborhood brought residents together to fight for a fairer storm recovery. And I think many of these lessons around who we're asking to be resilient um, and how traumatic experiences can expose historical inequality, coronavirus is teaching us the same lesson, but in a much more accelerated time frame. But it's really not whole, it, they're part of the same story, right? In terms of who's vulnerable, who do we help adapt, who um, is expected to bear the weight, the brunt of these crises moving forward. So one thing I learned, I heard again and again, was that often residents would feel sort of alone with their plight. They, this is especially true in the sort of 2010 to 2015 time frame when I was doing my early research, that a lot of communities didn't know of anyone else who shared in their circumstances. And in the absence of that information, of this idea that this is like a collective vulnerability that we share, um, residents started to do one-off interventions. They would lift their homes up, or on the right you see Kristen Massey's home in pre-Harvey Houston. She had flooded twice in the two years prior and back-to-back -back tax day and Memorial Day floods. And after her second flood in two years, she was like, okay, Harvey's coming, 
I'm going to literally wrap my house in, you know, like heavy duty saran wrap and sandbags and dump $5,000 into that in the hopes that I don't have to, um, that I can keep the floodwaters out. And it didn't work. Um, and so I think, you know, she's learning what so many of these different people living on the front lines of this problem are learning, that these individual fixes often fail. So that's sort of like one part of the story. And then simultaneously, like in the same decade that I've watched the United States inundated again and again by record-breaking storms, I've also seen another really powerful phenomenon start to unfold. So all across the country, and it's been fascinating to watch this, community-led flood survivor groups have been popping up. There's Residents Against Flooding in Houston, Low County Flooded States of America in Charleston, a Community Voice in New Orleans, Horry County Rising. The list goes on and on and on and on. And many begin online in advance of a storm, and they serve as information sharing networks after the storm around how to get your home um, assessed, how to file a flood claim. They talk about which contractors are the least likely to rip you off. And so I saw these individual groups pop up on Facebook, but in the latter half of the decade, I've also watched as those groups have started to band together. Um, and one of the ways that they're banding together is through something called the Anthropocene Alliance, which is a nationwide coalition of flood survivors that started in 2017 and already has over 100,000 members across the country. Every month, community letter leaders from these frontline communities get together to discuss what they've learned in attempting to adapt to flooding in their communities. And they've been Zooming long before we all had to Zoom. This is a screen, screen capture from uh, from one of their monthly meetings. In addition to having that sense of solidarity amongst groups, the Anthropocene Alliance also connects frontline communities to pro bono legal and scientific counsel. And it's helped these communities file unlawful wetlands development suits. Um, it's helped them apply for numerous federal grants. And also, they've appealed development permits and hosted educational forums. And in doing this, they're showing us that these communities have really important, these citizens have really important information around what are the absolute most vulnerable places. And they're helping empower them by connecting them to experts that can help develop grants written in a language that is recognizable or parsable by state and federal entities. And we, we know that that's one of the significant challenges in climate change adaptation, that especially in low-income communities, you often don't have civil servants who can write those grants. So eventually, back in Staten Island, Governor Cuomo listened to the residents of Oakland Beach, Oakwood Beach, and over the course of a year, he purchased and demolished 600 homes. A couple summers ago, I got the chance to go back to Oakwood and to visit with each of the three community leaders who were successful in securing a buyout. And something that really surprised me was that all five lived within, all three lived within a five mile radius of their original home. They were up the hill and out of the floodplain. And as we ate lunch, they told me that it wasn't just them who had stayed. Over 80% of folks who participated in the buyout stayed on Staten Island. So the island didn't hemorrhage property taxes, many, nor was the community shattered. Many people still hang out on the weekends. They go to the same butchers and bakers and grocers. The main thing that's shifted is their vulnerability to flooding. So that was a surprise for me, that folks stuck around. Because um, that's not something that we tend to hear when we imagine a future where there is some retreat from the coast. The other thing that really surprised me was I asked them what they felt about the new seawall that was potentially going in on the eastern shore of Staten Island. And Joe Tyrone, um, one of the organizers, said to me, we know sea levels are rising, and that's a temporary fix. Um, it's only going to give people a false sense of comfort. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about what moved those residents from climate change denial to acceptance. And it wasn't, I don't think it was their 
flooding problem because they had been flooding long before. They'd been flooding for decades. It's gotten worse, but it wasn't the flooding problem. I think many had been sort of reticent or didn't want to speak about climate change because they feared that in admitting that climate change was a force, they would lose some kind of agency over who they were and how they wanted to live. I felt like once they got to choose how they wanted to adapt, once they saw that climate change wouldn't necessarily mean the end of Oakwood Beach or the end of their community, um, that's how these people, I would suspect, started to move towards accepting that climate change was a significant factor in instigating this move. So I think that we need only look to Oakwood Beach for a little bit of that electric possibility that climate change can also awaken in us. When communities have been long made vulnerable by pre-existing, by existing structural inequalities, um, climate change deepens an awareness of vulnerability and also increasingly an awareness that vulnerability is shared amongst community members, but also you know, at the state and federal level. This realization brought residents of Oakwood Beach together, demanding access to one of the most progressive sea level rise adaptation strategies we have. And at an even more basic level, it helped them just regain a sense of control over their community's destiny. So looking back to that Joan Didion line, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. My work on rising regularly reminded me that the right to speak about one's shifting relationship to the environment and to have those stories heard is something that ought to be extended equally to all, but often isn't. So it might sound deceptively simple, but when a conversation has long been dominated by a select few, I think listening can be a really potent act. And it can help us upend some historic power imbalance. As the tides get higher and storms stronger, those long exposed to flooding who've lived in areas where property taxes cannot cover, cover the cost of innovative infrastructure solutions, they have precious knowledge that the rest of us don't. As the words they alight upon and excavate and share become part of the way that we use the vernacular that we use to describe these uncanny and improbable days, I think that's part of how this phenomenon can become more than just a catalyst for cataclysm. I think as the language around climate change loosens and becomes more democratic, our ability to seize this moment as an opportunity for coalition building, especially amongst vulnerable populations, is growing. Perhaps together, we will make that ever more popular protest chant come true. The seas are rising, and so are we. So I'll leave it there, and I would love to um, have you guys ask questions and have a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry that was a little loud. Um, that was lovely. Uh, at this time, we want to open the floor to questions, and I want to encourage the students, like I did last week, to come on down and ask some questions maybe first. Right, we got some some takers. And maybe if you could introduce yourself before you ask your question, that'd be great. I'm Emily, I'm a sophomore at URI. And my question is, is Staten Island going under? Like if Thwaites Glacier melts. If Thwaites Glacier melts, will Staten Island be gone? Um, that's a great question. So I had the wonderful pleasure of visiting Emily's class today. And I spoke a little bit about a research trip that I took to Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica, which has been nicknamed the Doomsday Glacier. You might know it as the Doomsday Glacier um, from Rolling Stone and Wired and all of these popular news outlets because it, the weights alone, um, it's the size of Great Britain, which is a huge glacier, <laughs> can rise sea levels, global sea levels, two feet. And it also has the potential, it kind of acts like a cork 
holding a lot of the West Antarctic ice shelf in place. And if the West Antarctic ice shelf becomes destabilized, um, it could rise global sea levels 10 feet. Will Staten Island be under water? Absolutely not, but parts of it will. Like Staten Island has Tote Hill, which is the second highest point on the eastern seaboard. So it has this topographical diversity. That's a strength of the island if you think about climate change adaptation and managed retreat. Let's say, you know, worst case scenario, the West Antarctic ice sheet falls apart and we get 10 feet of global sea levels. That means that anything between sort of 10 feet of high tide and high tide would be underwater. That might sound terrifying, and if you live in Florida or Louisiana, that probably should be sort of disconcerting, but a place that has a bit of topographical diversity has a lot of flex in terms of thinking about um, if 10 feet you know, between zero and 10 feet above sea level in Rhode Island were to go underwater, yes, we would lose a lot of our tidal marshes and we lose some of the lowest lying parcels, but that's certainly not the entirety of Rhode Island. Um, so when we think about how to start to enact managed retreat, um, and I've been excited to learn that there is already the spark of some conversation and actual planning happening in Warren around retreating from a very particular street, Market Street, that if you go out to Market Street in Warren on a, a high, high tide, it's underwater. I've seen it. I, I went down to the bay to try to check out Jacob's Point, actually, in a storm event. And to get there, I had to go on Market Street and was like, oh, well, there you go. This street's underwater. Um, so there's talk of and they're working on moving some of the low-income housing that's on Market Street into um, Medicom Avenue in Warren. And that kind of pairing upland development with sort of extinguishing development rights along the lowest-lying parcels of land is, I think, a strategy that we're going to see enacted more and more often. Uh, all around the all around the country, they're already doing some of that in Norfolk, Virginia. But it still remains this really sticky question of um, people have asked me, you know, how do you get people to want to move? Do you like not fix the road after the storm? Do you not fix the electricity? Do you stop maintaining infrastructure? And that feels very coercive to me. Um, and is not, I think, the answer, but I think that part of the answer is starting to have conversations in communities where we're already recognizing this vulnerability is ongoing about what's important to you about your community. How could some of that or the majority of that be preserved? Um, could we help you move literally half a mile away and get you up and out of the floodplain? Um, what are some of the things that you'd like to see added if we're going to do some kind of investment in this upland um, corridor. So they're trying to do, you know, commercial investment on Medicom Avenue in Warren, which is like a little bit strip molly and kind of like uh, could use a shock of investment money. So I think there's also a lot of opportunities there if we get out ahead of the storm, the storm literally. My name is Simon, and I'm also a student in the honors program here. Once people have been displaced by a sea level rise or storm event, and they've then become climate refugees, what have you found is the greatest challenge throughout your research that people encounter after that point? Um. There's so many challenges, and I think it's really important to also remember, that's a great question. It's also really important to remember when we talk about managed retreat, that unmanaged retreat is ongoing, right? That's sort of what you're talking about. When, when people have a storm and they can't get back into their homes because um, it's a rental and they, the landlord is not going to repair it or is going to 
repair it and try to flip it into a higher end development. Like those people get displaced too and we're not helping them move. So then they're kind of on the winds of fate. Um, so one of the things that we see when we talk about unmanaged retreat, I think that's really discouraging is, for instance, a lot of refugees from Katrina, Katrina had very little, or New Orleans had very little in terms of temporary housing that it could offer residents after Katrina that was anywhere near the city center. So a lot of folks moved to Houston and a lot of the places that took in Katrina refugees were these lower income areas of Houston which, lo and behold, are also really flood prone. So then, um, 10 years later, they get smacked by Harvey. So we see actually in, when, and it's very, it's very hard to keep track of what happens if someone's not in a managed retreat program. Um, so th I reference this because it's one of the few like decent studies out there that we have around what happens post-storm with people who don't have immediate aid to get back into their homes. And so we're finding that they're just jumping from one bubble of vulnerability to another bubble of vulnerability. And that matches again to sort of those early slides that I showed about social vulnerability and flood vulnerability that we see that we, you know, New York City has a ton of public housing on land that used to be wetlands. That's because that's just cheap land. Um, and so when we don't help people move away from risk permanently, we're also often actually ingraining that vulnerability because they move from affordable place to affordable place. It's a really good question. Um, hi, I'm Camilla. Um, and I was wondering what are the government or the community doing uh, of what um, a good speech because um, they already move and you said um, how they are locating in a pretty near area again so what are they doing to not have to move again just try to really solve or at least um, decrease the fastness of the sea level sea level rise. So what are they doing just to not have move again and move again? Is there anything they are currently practicing? So um, with the manager retreat that happened in Staten Island, as I understand it, um, there was a mandate in place that said that if two things, if you stay within the five boroughs, the city will give you a 5% bonus on closing. They knew that it was expensive to stay nearby, so they tried to incentivize that. And they also said, but you have to move out of the floodplain. So there's also, if you're um, running managed retreat programs through federal and state sponsorship, you can put in place rules around where people go. Like, we'll give you pre-storm prop value for your house and we'll even give you a bump to stay nearby, but you can't buy back on the beach. Like you can't go back to these low, super low-lying areas. Um, as Oakwood Beach continues to unfold, you would think that the story is over, but then there's this really interesting question that happens with, okay, we bought out a lot of homes. We de demolished a lot of homes. We've turned that back into green space primarily, but who's in charge of maintaining that green space, right? So the city, um, the state actually, for up until next year is like legally responsible for the maintenance of those parcels and they go out there and they mow and they reseeded land with native grasses and it's really neat to watch sort of the old wetlands ecology come back there but they're also trying to physically sell that land. They're trying to sell it to the New York Parks Department because they don't want to be saddled with taking care of it. I helped a team of artists put in a bid to make it into a public memorial where they would plant um, a graded field of cherry blossom trees that as 
sea levels rose would slowly kill the cherry blossom trees and it would become this like physical memorial sculpture to go into that space. Uh, but there hasn't been funding to show up for that even though they won a, a design competition for the National Parks um, program. So it's tricky. There's there are sticky, tricky afterlives to manage retreat that I think we're still in the very, very, very early days of even wrapping our heads around. Um, so great question. Yeah, I gotta ask one final okay. question, <laughs> which um, the state motto is is hope, and this is a tough topic that we're talking about. And can you? What gives you not only hope, but maybe happiness in, in this somewhat difficult subject? That's also a great question, um, and one that I've thought a lot about. And my response goes in two directions at once. I think if you really decide to commit to working in the sphere of climate change anything, you will move through periods of grief and I think that's true of not just people who are committed to climate change. I think a lot of us, I've noticed an uptick in friends and family members over the past two years who have come to me and said something like, it's so sad. And I'm like, it is so sad. Um, and so, you know, that I'm thinking of a friend who lost the the fight the forest where she used to take her kids camping in Oregon um, to wildfires last summer and now they just drive through it and this it's like this you know tinderbox like I don't know it's like a burnt down dec decimated area and I think it's important to recognize how hard it is to have these emotions in our lives and then to take care of ourselves. So sometimes when I feel very uh, in a place of deep grief, I try to do something that brings me happiness, like go for a long hike or a long bike ride um, and to honor the things that replenish me. So that's like a way of sort of staying buoyant through grief. And then there's another thing that's sort of like, it actually fills me with a lot of hope to see communities come together and to advocate for um, the changes that they'd like to see happen. It also fills me with a lot of hope to see like the rise of the sunrise movement and to see the, when I listen to young people talk about climate change, so often I'm struck by how instinctually they equate environmental justice and social justice, that was not part of my worldview until very recently. And so I think the fact that it's increasingly sort of like baked into how young people think also fills me with a lot of hope. Um, so thank you. You guys are part of my source of hope. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So to conclude, um, we do have, you may have seen in the, the foyer, there are books for sale, so you are, can purchase those there, and we're going to invite people, if you want to get a book signing, um, to queue up along this aisle, and there'll be a process. We we'll want to keep everybody on the floor, try and maintain social distancing, but uh, we'll bring books. Uh, Elizabeth will stay up on the stage, and we'll hand books, and she can sign. Um, I want to remind you again, there's the movie screening this week, Tidewater, on Thursday at 7 p.m. You've got to register online. And uh, again, next week, we have a fabulous panel on coasting crisis, risk and resilience in New England. So let's give her another round of applause. Thank you.
why I worked on that book. It was sitting in strangers' living rooms and listening to those stories. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Give away that guilt. You don't need